Hey, everybody. Welcome to this week's episode of Whiskey Neat, Spirited Conversations with Interesting People. I am your host, Christopher Hart. Now, uh, the last couple of weeks have been fun. Uh, Josh Horowitz last week. This week, we're going to be sitting down with uh, Ryan George of Screen Rant. Uh, you may know him from his pitch meeting videos. One of the most incredible, one of the most prolific, one of the most amazing binge-watching experiences on YouTube. Uh, incredible. If you haven't seen them, take two minutes. Go to YouTube. Google or Google search for um, screen rant pinch meetings and uh, just pick one. They're they're absolutely brilliant. I absolutely love everything he does, and I thought it'd be great to have a few drinks with the guy. So this week we'll be sitting down with Ryan George. Um, before we get to that though, let's let's get into a couple things. So last week we released batch four, the Prideful Goat. Uh, it's coming to Florida, Louisiana, and California. Prideful Goat fifteen. It's the last of it. Um, for those of you who came last week into the release, I appreciate it. Uh, the rye is available um, still in those four states. It's also coming to a few more. We're, we're adding Colorado, Illinois, uh, Kentucky, Canada. It's going to be incredible. So um, let's uh, let's get to paying the bills here, guys. So um, I've talked about Waterford before. We start the episode off with drinking Waterford. Uh, Waterford, if you're familiar with the concept of terroir and wine, you'll appreciate Mark Rainier's Waterford Single Malt Whiskey from Ireland. Mark is an absolute madman, mad scientist. He's the Willy Wonka of Irish single malt whiskey. The man is a genius. Um, and it all comes down to authenticity. The terroir code of each bottle, the farm it comes from, the, the harvest, the grain, the location, uh, everything about the bottle is located, uh, everything about what's in the bottle is located on the bottle. Those terroir codes are amazing. 100% pure Irish barley creates an intensity of flavors derived from exceptionally Uh, exceptional steps in the distilling process. Uh, Watford's hyper rare cuvee series flavor through complexity, layering components, components from several farms. Uh, The Arcadian series, which we talked about, I actually drank today the organic Gaia. Uh, I think this is the Gaia 2.1. Yeah, 2.1. I've thoroughly enjoyed these bottles. I've talked about them every week. Irish whiskey is one of my, uh, I really feel like they're going through a bit of a renaissance. Uh, I couldn't be a bigger fan. Be sure to go to glassreb.com slash Waterford to check out where to find the product. Every You can type in the terroir code in the website. Um, I mean, everything Glass Rev is doing is, is absolutely tremendous. The Amroot, you guys, we've talked about them for years. Uh, I, I couldn't be a bigger fan. So uh, without further ado, please welcome uh, Ryan George from Screen Rant. Cheers. Dude, I, I, so I'm so excited to talk to you. I, I've been following your journey for a long time, and um, it's interesting. You look young, but actually, if you go back and look at some of your other channels that you've you've been on, there's an old video of you guys talking about uh, you and your friends. What if guys just spoke what they thought out loud? And yeah, and, and you look all of about 16 years old, like like a nice young buck. <laughs> yeah, I had I had the shaved head. I think I was probably 19 or 20. I had like my chive.com shirt on and that, that was the first viral video that I ever did. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I thought that that was the first surge of adrenaline, right? That's the first thing that kind of sucked you in. A hundred percent. If that hadn't happened, I don't think I would still be doing YouTube. Um, you know, it was that first kind of jolt of encouragement of, of, Oh, you can like, people might actually watch the stuff that you do. Because before that, we were just putting out videos and, you know, nobody was watching. So that was the first one. It got a couple million and it was kind of back then that was a bigger deal than it is now. Like we were on the local news and stuff because of that. But now that's just you need those many views if you want to do this for a living. Uh, But back then that was a big deal. You know, YouTube was kind of newish. It was like 2010, 2011, I think that was a that was a big deal. So was, was monetization happening then? You know, I, I think it was, I think it was, but I don't think many people were doing YouTube full time. Um, certainly not. I think we probably made, you know, a couple hundred bucks off that video. So it wasn't uh, (laughs) very much still had day jobs for many, many years after that. Yeah. I think, I think a couple million views is, is quite a bit more now, right? I mean, it's, it's not yeah, not, not, not much more. Brandon says. Um, so how how many videos have you done in total? Do you know? Have you hit the five hundred mark yet? Oh God, um, I've 
I'm, I, I feel like I've hit the 500 mark. I haven't counted, but on my own channel, yeah, no, I've passed 500 for sure. Because on my own channel, I'm getting close to 200. I have probably 275 pitch meetings, another hundred something videos on that channel I have with my friends, uh, Moving Mind Studio. And then just like all the other random videos that I've done. Yeah, I'm, I'm in the, yeah, I'm past 500, um, less than a thousand probably. <laughs> yeah, the, uh, you mentioned you were 19. H how old are you now? 32. 32. Man, yeah. slightly younger than me, 34. <laughs> yeah, that's so awesome. And the, the impact you've had in such a short time. Um, I remember <clears throat> some of the, the first videos I caught of you. And I think this is how your channel works. I think someone finds you and then immediately binges 50 of those videos. There's no way you, it's like a can of Pringles. There's no way you watch one and then just, that's it. That, got, that was great. I think I'm good. Uh, they're just short enough. They're like Harry Potter chapters, right? What you remember, I remember as a kid, Harry Potter was such a big part of my life that you would watch, you would read a chapter and you're like, shit, it's 10 o'clock at night. I got to go to bed. But another chapter is like four more pages. So you would keep, yeah. you would keep reading another chapter, another chapter. So yeah, I mean, the way that you've done this, uh, and it's obviously evolved over time and in such a short amount of time. Um, I, I did want to ask, you've talked about the fact you've mentioned having a girlfriend before. Mm -hmm. um, and I've seen a couple interviews spanning a few years. I've wondered, is it the same girlfriend? And if so, <laughs> how has this, this particular thing affected your dating life? You know, both meeting a girl and telling her what you do. And then two, if it's the same girlfriend, just maintaining that relationship. I've been with the same woman for 15 years. Yeah, no, I've been with my girlfriend for uh, seven, eight years now. So it's been, um, I've been doing YouTube full time for four or five. So, um, you know, we started dating when I was, you know, I, I wasn't getting any views on YouTube or anything. I was, uh, I was kind of not making videos with my friends either. I was in a weird phase where I was just kind of like doing stand up in Montreal a little bit. Oh, we're uh, going to get to that for sure. Okay. I'm a huge stand up fan. Um, yeah, so she's she's kind of been there since the beginning of me even just <clears throat> developing the style of making videos myself at home on a green screen and playing multiple characters. And she's she's been there through um, even like we we did a, a kind of a web series for for Kevin Hart with my friend. She was there when that happened, and she's been there through through the whole time. So she's really seen it evolve. And I shoot the videos at home, so she's very aware of like. You know, when I'm recording, I'm like, can you please put on earphones? Because I'm going to be talking to myself and sound insane for the next hour. <laughs> it's just like, it's a little embarrassing. And she's like, yep, nope. She knows the drill. She like puts in headphones and she's uh, super supportive. Yeah, it's, it's been great. Well, so I mean, I, I would imagine, uh, I think I've told the story uh, on camera when we decided, when my wife and I decided to have kids um, again, um, so, so we have, uh, older teenage daughters and then a oh. five and a six year old, uh, we decided to do it again five or six years ago. We're like, I have this idea for a whiskey business. And it was like, it was a hard pitch at first, right? Like just the, mm -hmm. trying to convince her that it's a real job, and right. then, but she was very supportive of the whole thing. And then eventually when everything took off, she was like, all right, I'm, you were right. You know? Uh, and I was like, yeah. don't ever doubt me again. Uh, <laughs> but <laughs> But um, I, I would imagine it's at some point, I mean, just the, the rise to, to complete star. I mean, you're a, you got a manager, you're, you're, in, you've done a lot in a very short amount of time, buddy. Oh, thanks. Yeah. I appreciate it. Um, yeah. It's, it's great to have a, a manager for, for that kind of stuff. Help me navigate the kind of, you know, ad opportunities and, and podcasts and whatnot. It's, I, I I wouldn't be able to do anything like this if I didn't have that help either. You know, I, I get to just focus on making the content, which is the most important thing. So, um, and that's now, pretty much all I do. <laughs> and you've, you've mentioned before that, it, you know, the actual filming and editing is not that long of a process, but it's everything leading up to that. <clears throat> I'm curious, how many hours a week are you working and watching and trying to pick apart movies and, and things? Um, it's, it's a tough question for my own sketches because um, a lot of that work is trying to come up with funny ideas, which is a lot of just 
staring blankly at the wall for hours, which doesn't look mushrooms. like work, but it is. <laughs> and it's awful and it hurts. And it's just like every week is just kind of like, I'm never going to have a funny idea again. Uh, and you just go through that every, every week. Um, with pitch meetings, I've kind of, at a certain point after doing it for three years, I kind of sat down and decided to analyze what I had been doing and the process of it and was able to kind of break it down into something that makes a little more sense schedule wise. I used to just research a movie for hours and hours and hours and hours and hours, reading every you know, Reddit thread, watching every review, just every single discussion, comment sections. I wanted everyone's angle on this movie to find like what's working for people and what's not working for people and what are moments that people hate and stuff. And um, I kind of managed to, to kind of sketch out um, a system where I could probably do all that research in three, four concentrated hours. Um, and then the writing in another three, four concentrated hours. And then the, the, write, the shooting and editing takes another three, four hours. So it's usually like, you know, 12 to 14 hours of concentrated work which can take three days because of just, you know, it's not how life works. Yeah. Yeah. It's like an eight hour work day isn't necessarily eight hours of concentrated work. You know, there's life and, and whatever. So um, I kind of have a system worked out now, but it, it took a couple of years to, to figure that out for sure. Yeah. The, uh, <clears throat> the process has, it definitely seems to be pretty polished now. Uh, I, I, yeah. when I watch episodes now, the there's things that I did notice in the, in the early days. And then when you go back and you watch the early ones, the, the way your tone of voice is the you're more, much more of a dramatic version of yourself now than you were back then. And then you see it develop over time into a much more uh, character, you know, a characterized version. Uh, so it, it's been interesting to see uh, it's now a completely streamlined, clean cut, Boom, boom, boom. And it, like, perfect. Like the, the formula is, is definitely shined. Um, I wanted to uh, address the thing you just said about going through and finding all of these threads of, of people bitching and complaining about movies and, and season eight of Game of Thrones. Uh, <clears throat> are there versions of this in which you do it without actually seeing the film? And it's solely it's based solely on the feedback from from these Reddit threads and stuff. I mean, you're about to say yes, I could feel it. There's a, there's a version of that, but there's there is after I watch a movie, the first step is sitting down and writing down all my own notes. Um, and so that is an important part of it. And so I could I don't want the videos to just be some like Frankenstein monster of Reddit comments, you know, like it, sure. it has to it has to come from things that I actually feel also. Um, and then also sometimes I'll find a bunch of people agreeing on a certain point, but then I'll be like, well, no, that's no, you guys are all wrong. Like, and it's important for me to, to be able to distinguish that by having seen the movie myself and analyze it myself. So that is definitely <laughs> part of it. Are there, uh, are there ones that you've done that you genuinely hated doing because you loved it so much like you like you just said you didn't agree <laughs> you didn't agree with all these points being brought up but enough people it's enough of it was in the zeitgeist that you you like oh, okay i'm doing this for them not for me and and the videos have to be relatable to them so do you know what i'm saying yeah i understand what you're saying yeah no i don't really I, no i won't really put something in a video unless it isn't um i i try to keep everything as objectively true as much as possible. So um, the things I'm talking about is like everyone is saying that something is a plot hole, then if there is an actual explanation for it, a conceivable explanation for it, then I'm not gonna mention it or I'll mention it, but then I'll I'll mention the convenient resolution to that, that plot element and whatnot, you know? Um, yeah. You, you often uh, credit John Mulaney as the birth of this. Yeah, hundred percent. Have you idol? <laughs> have you met him? 
No, I haven't met him. God, that would be a dream. Uh, It'd be incredible. The guy's a, a, a yeah. an icon of of a lot of incredibly iconic sketches from SNL were were his, right? There was yeah, uh, his writing uh, yeah. backstory. So good. I mean, I've seen him a couple of times live. I'm seeing him again in May. Uh, yeah, he's one of the best. He's he's absolutely and like my comedy is obviously I do sketch comedy, so it's not and I play multiple characters. So it's not exactly the same as him, but yeah, yeah like on SNL, he wrote a ton of amazing sketches and, and in his stand up, the back to the future kind of bit Pitch. is definitely yeah. what inspired this. Just looking at movies from that perspective of the moment when someone's trying to sell it is the basis of this. It's, it's basically it's that combined with me making sketches where I talk to myself. That's kind of the marriage of it, you know, which I was already doing that. And I it kind of just like the two things clicked and it just seems like a great way to analyze movies. So never look back. Does, uh, does your girlfriend ever, like, do you ever make her watch? Like, tell me this is good. Like, is there something missing? Is there, does she ever provide feedback to your process? Sometimes, you know, she, she'll only join me to watch movies that she's interested in seeing. Otherwise, I just go to the movies by myself. But when we do see movies together, we do discuss, we kind of debrief after the movie and bounce things back. And if something didn't work for her, I'm very interested in hearing what it was and why and all that. So yeah, she's a good kind of sounding board for that. Otherwise, it's just me alone in my car, which is a lot sadder. <laughs> <laughs> the, uh, I don't, it's probably the booze talking, but I just had this idea. Uh, when the time comes to propose, are you going to film a pitch meeting proposal and then make her watch it? God, no. <laughs> God, no. <laughs> do, do you Never. ever feel uh, a, a bit, um, what's the word? Not disconnected, but do you ever feel like um, like th that this is what you want to do in particular for, like, for instance, I love the show. We've been doing it for mm. years, but there are times that I have so much of other things going on that I need a break. Do you ever take breaks? Um, I'm working on that now. I, I kind of recently, last month, took a couple of weeks off for the first time in four years. Uh, and I hadn't even realized that it had been four years that I made a video every single week. <clears throat> so yeah, it, it, it's been kind of a blur because I've been working so much. Uh, I, 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 I really didn't realize. And even in those weeks off, I still made videos on my own channel. So it wasn't like a full on break um yeah i don't know it, it's once stuff starts working you kind of just want it you, you want to keep doing it for as long as you can in a way but uh youtube was never my intended career or anything it was always i always viewed youtube as kind of a portfolio to show that i can write comedy and perform comedy and then hopefully leverage that into work in more traditional media, like writing for movies or TV or performing movies and TV. Um, and just kind of accidentally, it became the full-time gig. But, you know, I'm well aware, I, I don't think I'm gonna be doing YouTube when I'm 50 or if YouTube will still exist. So in a way it still is kind of uh, a, a portfolio. It's just, that's been kind of delayed because it's my full-time job now and it's going well and I enjoy it. And um, yeah, and it does kind of, it has opened doors into what I intended to do. You know, like I have, I, I get to have meetings with people that I never would have had meetings with if I hadn't been doing YouTube. Uh, it definitely opens doors. It's just. How many I views? Sorry, sorry I, I didn't mean to interrupt you. I was going to say, how many views um, uh, are you uh, up to total combined um, that, that would obviously open the door to some of those conversations? Uh, in to total views, um, I'm probably, I don't know, I'm, I'm upwards of half a billion at this point. Yeah, but, that, would, that would open some doors for conversations. Yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah, sometimes, like, I mean, I, people reach out, you know, the, I've been, there are so many episodes of pitch meetings that sometimes they just pop up in people's feeds and people take a chance and they click on the stupid thumbnails with the giant eyes and, uh, <laughs> and uh Sometimes, you know, people who have produced the movies that I've made fun of reach out and say, and say they're like, oh, that's actually not far off from how it happened, <laughs> you know? 
so that cool. starts conversations and, and that's very fun to talk with those people. Um, so yeah, there wasn't a specific view count that kind of opened doors, but just progressively, um, if there was one kind of turning point where I think the series kind of really took off is the Game of Thrones. Um, season eight finale or yeah. season eight series. Yeah. I think there was so much anger around that, that a video just pointing out all the flaws was widely cir circulated and, and landed in a lot of people's inboxes and whatnot. Yeah. I mean, that's uh, the, the process has to take so much time. I can't even imagine in those four years, if you were sick, how you worked around that or, um, and, and yeah, I did have a question that you pretty much already answered, but I was going to ask you if anyone ever made a film, an actor or a director reached out to you out of anger with the way that you approached making fun of their film. Um, it's funny. No, not, not with anger. Um, the only people who have reached out, it's been because they've enjoyed it, which I guess if they're really mad about an internet video, they won't go as far as to like email the guy that made it. So it's very possible that a lot of, there's a lot of angry people out in Hollywood, <laughs> but <laughs> they've never, they've never reached out for me, to me. So I'm blissfully unaware. Uh, I've only heard the good stuff. We'll see. Maybe I'll get like an angry email from Michael Bay one day or something. <laughs> <laughs> well, you wouldn't be the first. Uh, I heard, uh, what was her name? Dolly Parton still use, sends fax. Really? So, yeah. Miley Cyrus mentioned in an interview that she doesn't even call Ma you know, Dolly is Miley Cyrus's, uh, was it, uh, mother and not mother-in-law, uh, godmother, godmother. And she can't just pick up the phone to call Dolly Parton. Dolly sends a fax. And I so find that to have an active fax machine at your house. <laughs> yeah. Or I'm sure she might fax to an email address. You know, she writes it out and then faxes it. To, I mean, nowadays you can oh. fax to emails. I don't know. Oh, the I think, didn't even know that. Oh, yeah. wow. Fax technology has very much improved. <laughs> <laughs> oh man. Uh, all right. I need another pour. I just poured some more for myself. <clears throat> um, Experimental. Oh, um, I, I don't know what all you can talk about this and we, I don't want to make any assumptions, but um, Brandon mentioned to me after I reached out to you, I was like, you know, I'm going to talk to Ryan George. And he said, uh, you know, he just left the screen, right? Like, no, no, no. what'd you say? I don't think he left the screen, right? I think pitch meeting got its own channel separate. Right. Screen yeah. Yeah. That's what I meant. Sorry. Yeah, exactly. Um, yeah. Basically it just made sense um, for them to, the content on Screen Rant is so different from pitch meetings that it made sense to, and I think if pitch meeting was strong enough that it can kind of run its own channel uh, and have the audience follow. So it just kind of made sense um, after a couple of years to, to make that move. And I, I'm sure like the YouTube algorithm will be less confused about everything also. <laughs> it's just kind of like yeah. movie, movie trivia and then like random guy talking to himself once a week. It's, it's sure. easier for everyone. Uh, but my role, you know, I, hasn't changed. I just, just make the videos and they publish and, and promote and do whatever they do. So um, it's cool, but it, yeah, I guess it changes more for the viewers than, than it does for me. And I'm, I'm happy to see, you know, positive feedback that people are like, oh, okay, good. I can, you know, just get notified when a pitch meeting goes up. So Sure. Ryan, speaking of positive feedback, I noticed that you really uh you acquired a lot of subscribers in a short amount of time on that new channel what are you up to as far as subs on the new channel and kind of talk about how gratifying that is to have that kind of following to where all you have to say is new channel and everyone floods there and starts 1.1 1. 1 or something 1.2 yeah that was kind of surreal um i've only put out one original pitch meeting on that channel uh, as of this recording and i think we're already at 410,000 subscribers. Um, so that, that was very cool to see. I mean, kind of in a day, in 24 hours, it was at 100,000. Um, yeah, it was, I, I mean, it was, it was really cool to see. I'm, I'm kind of disconnected a little from, you know, I don't go read comments that much. Um, I'm, I'm not super active on social media. So it was cool to kind of see the actual numbers of like, oh, this many people, like as soon as they heard that there's a new channel subscribed, 
without even any content being there other than like a couple of compilation things. That was really cool. Like I really, really appreciated that. So you, you mentioned before that several years ago, you, you gave stand-up comedy a shot and gave up on it. Um, this was before the takeoff of pitch meeting, correct? Correct. Yeah. So you now have an insane following. Have you thought about trying it again? I've thought of it, but so stand up for me was a weird period in my life where my friends and I had a sketch comedy channel and we were putting out sketches, but that became harder and harder to do with our lives and our jobs and, and whatnot. So we kind of told ourselves, let's just focus on bigger projects together. Let's try to get, you know, web series made or TV shows and whatnot. Um, and the problem with that is that you end up doing paperwork for about a year, just asking for permission to get something produced. And during that time, I wasn't creating anything. I wasn't doing anything related to comedy. So stand up for me was just kind of an outlet for that. Um, something that I could do on my own to write and perform funny things. But I mean, I, I live in Montreal and there aren't many kind of comedy clubs. There's a couple of stages. So you can, if, if you're lucky, you can do, you can do a couple of five minute sets a week, you know, like maybe two or three. It's not like LA or New York where you can hit a bunch of clubs in one night and get a bunch of experience real fast. You need to, you need to send a lot of emails and then maybe you'll get a couple of spots. So it was taking a really long time to get any stage time. And I was okay at it, but I wasn't great. And I couldn't see a world where I could get great in Montreal without, you know, doing the, the, I mean, some people do it, but it's very, very difficult to do. Um, meanwhile, I had all this video skill set, you know, so that kind of was a shift after stand up to like, I'm, I might as well just, this is another thing I can do by myself. I just need to adapt my sketch comedy to doing it all myself at home. And, and uh, that's kind of like, that was kind of the transition period between making sketch comedy with a group of people into doing it myself by way of having a hard time with stand up. <laughs> There, um, <clears throat> I've tried, um, I had two open mics and that was enough for me. <laughs> uh, the first one went decent. Right. Second one was enough to kill any hopes. And I, I wondered hearing you talk about it, if it, you had a couple of rough sets, um, it can be quite, uh, you know, you mentioned you don't read comments uh, online. Um, is it because, uh, the internet can be such a hard place or you just don't have the bandwidth for it? Part of it is bandwidth. Part of it is, yeah, the negativity shines through much more than the positivity, unfortunately. And like, I'm, I'm lucky enough that my videos overwhelmingly are positive, but positive, I will yeah. find those negative comments and let them ruin my day, you know? <laughs> so it's like, I, I'm very, very good at that. So I do, I'll usually check the first comments that come in and like, what are the, what are the main things that people say, but I'm, I don't dig, you know, I don't, because I know I'll be able to find something that makes me doubt my own skills or whatever. Um, in standup, it was, I mean, I didn't have, I, I had a couple of, of rough sets, but it was more about the environment where it's just these, you know, sometimes I'll have open mics in bars where people didn't know there was an open mic going on. And yeah. then you're, you're just a guy talking into a microphone in the corner. So, I mean, those are fun in their own way. Cause you're just <laughs> at that point, like your jokes don't even matter. You can say whatever you want. You just start like riffing on whatever's happening in the actual bar. But um, I did find like just the nerves to go up on stage. I found I needed to have like a couple of beers before going up on stage just to kill the nerves. And very quickly, I was like, this isn't a healthy habit. <laughs> this isn't good. <laughs> this isn't going to go down any good roads. So, um, yeah, I mean, I did it for, I guess, a year or, or two. And then it just, I even like, I, I was living downtown Montreal. And then I moved further away from downtown. And it just became like, I couldn't justify traveling an hour to do five minutes for a crowd of 10 people 
eight of which were the other comics. You know, there was just no path to growth. It's a long and very slow path. A hundred percent. And and uh, props to the people that hustle through that and, and go through that grind and manage to do something with that. But I was just like, there's no way. I can't. You, I can't. You, and I'm sitting on these other skills that I have that I've developed for years. So it just made sense. Uh, but I would like, I'd be curious to try it again at some at some point. But then there's also part of me would feel bad because when you do have a kind of audience online, you kind of get pushed ahead of those people that are grinding, you know, and you, maybe you'll get a better slot or you'll get a bit more stage time. And that feels slightly unfair to the people that are hustling out there trying to be stand up comics. But I mean, maybe I, maybe I try and open mic at a certain point, but I don't know. I haven't honestly, I haven't really thought about it in, in a couple of years. Well, there's uh, uh, with the amount that you're, trying to consume of pop culture, at least within cinema and TV shows. Uh, do you have time for podcasts? Are you aware of what's going on in the podcasting realm with, you know, Rogan or any of these comedian podcasters? Do you, do you follow any of those? I follow, I mean, I, I listen to podcasts once in a while when I'm like doing dishes or going for a run or something. Um, one that I listen to a lot is Dax Shepard. He's fantastic. I, I'm I chair expert. Movie. Yeah. Um, that's great. Um, I don't have a ton that I listen to like, uh, Pete Holmes. I listen to a lot of interview kind of podcasts where I'm listening to guests that interest me. Like specifically, I don't like binge listen to every single episode necessarily. Um, yeah, there's a couple, I, I just like me personally, I'm much more comfortable having the time to script what I'm going to say and really think things through before you know like I'm, I'm i'm less comfortable being myself essentially I'm, a, I'm i'm comfortable being these wacky characters but just like this is is foreign to me what we're doing right now <laughs> <laughs> oh that's great um pete holmes is one of my my white whales i uh, we both come from extremely almost cult-like religious backgrounds and have okay. broken past that. Uh, and, and Pete Holmes is someone that I think would be interesting. And, and I, I understand you're uncomfortable with, you know, in your own skin, but I, I think that uh, you see a lot of these, the reason why I'm asking all these questions around it is you see a lot of these both actors and celebrities make the transition from stand-up comedy to podcasting or uh, the podcasting actually aids with their, uh, their touring uh, live shows, a lot of podcastings do live shows. So I, I, I feel like a lot of what you can do, especially with your following could translate to some of that. Um, of course that would take up quite a bit of time for sure. Um, and yeah, I just wasn't sure if you listened to had time to even consume a podcast, you know what I mean? Right. Yeah. I mean, what I could see doing is, uh, either a scripted podcast or a very conceptual slightly improvised podcast uh i don't know if you heard i mean john mulaney and nick kroll uh during the pandemic they kind of they put out this podcast as their characters from oh hello uh and they were like they were they were gonna do investigate the princess diana story you know <laughs> ironically it became like it read it got into the news again because of the crown and the and the, the movie spencer but they were doing it ironically as if they were investigating something that was very widely documented and as if they were going to crack it. It was, it was really, really funny. There was uh, a, I can see myself doing something like that. Digestible uh, podcast, another one called 10 minute podcast. Did you ever listen to that one? Bill was, <clears throat> no, 10 minute podcast was uh, Will Sasso. Yes. Uh, yes. Yeah. yeah and, and Will Sasso is an improv and he's Canadian. Uh, yeah, huge, huge, huge fan of his. I've watched him back and I was a mad TV guy growing up, not a Saturday Night Live okay. guy. And, uh, but 10 minute podcast, him, Chris D'Elia and Brian Callen. And the, the show that. eventually went away, but, um, and I think two of the three of those have had a rough couple of years, uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, digestible skits riffing. I mean, it was a, it was a brilliant show. Um, I wanted to also find out, do you have any staff, anyone that helps you at all besides your manager, of course? No, no, I don't. It's just me. Um, yeah, no, I do everything myself. I've kind of 
for for maybe six months, a couple of years ago, um, Screen Rant kind of assigned me a, a researcher, but ultimately it's just kind of like when I'm doing research, I know it when I see it. Like I I, I can see when something's gonna be a bit. And and so it just wasn't, I just wasn't using the research that was given to me, unfortunately. So it just, uh, we just kind of reverted back to me doing it myself because it, it just, it just became another part of my research that I'd have to read through somebody's notes and then not use them, you know? Right. Just, uh, yeah. And then, and then same thing for editing, you know, Screen Rant has offered to, to have editors come on to, to help do that part. But as I've mentioned before in other interviews and whatnot, editing is so mechanical at this point that it's, uh, it's one of the fastest parts of the process. And also I know which takes are good because I just did them, you know? I'm I, like, I know the third line of this line is, is the best one because that's why I moved on to the next line. I know that's the good line, you know? Um, so to have to sit down with someone and go through the footage and give them the notes, in the same time, I could just edit it myself. So there's no way that that would be helpful, you know? Or efficient in any way, yeah. Yeah, so if there was someone in the room with me taking those notes and then taking off the footage, maybe that would be helpful, but it would shave off like two hours of my workload. So I don't know that it would be worth it, to be honest. I'm just kind of, yeah. Do you have to run all of these by screen rent first or do you have complete creative control? Basically with screen rent, we just, I submit kind of a calendar of movies that I'd like to do a mix of new releases uh, or just old movies that are popular that I haven't covered yet. And then um, they just, either they approve or they say, oh, you know what, uh, maybe this movie we can shift to this week or whatever. We just kind of work out the calendar together. And then, um, then I'm really off. Like I, I they, they just let me do my thing and then I upload it onto their kind of like have like a content management platform. And then they, I honestly don't even know if they review them, but they just, they just kind of like publish them. Oftentimes I'm, I'm finishing the pitch meeting like 20 minutes before they go live. Like up a lot of times it's down to the wire. I'm just like putting final touches and uploading. I'm like, Oh, it's up, it's up, it's up. Um, so I don't know that th there's not that much time for a review and they've never come back with feedback of like, Oh, can you take this joke out or anything? Absolutely not. Like they just let me do whatever I want, which is awesome. So they've never killed a skit or, uh, maybe even provided feedback about a problematic skit you've done on your own channel or something else. No, I mean, the only feedback I've gotten is like back when pitch meeting was starting to take off, I was still kind of like making sketches roasting movies on my channel and they were kind of like they kindly asked like can you not do that because we pay you to do that here and i was like oh yeah you know what that does make sense i didn't even think of that um so like when you go on my channel i just kind of it's and it's liberating in a sense it's everything except movies and tv and then if i want to make fun of movies and tv i do it on screen rant and uh yeah it's great i have free reign to do whatever i want yeah, you, you figured out a way to uh, unlock Pandora's box because even on your own channel, I mean, the movie things, uh, an endless, I mean, there's a thousand movies released a year. There's yeah. an endless uh, plethora of things to, to make fun of. But Pretty then also <laughs> yeah, on your own channel, you'll, you'll, it's like, it's almost like you took Lotus Edibles or something and just thought of literally everything the first guy with a name the first guy to assassin <laughs> somebody and so it, it's it's uh, i can only imagine that these have got to come to you in bursts right like you're you just sit down you'd write down 50 things that come to mind the first guy to this the first guy to that um yeah it's it's just uh i, I can't imagine it and obviously do you have a, a boundary in terms of things that are problematic like things you won't make fun of uh cuss words uh is there things that you try to avoid I mean, I, I do try to avoid cursing. Um, sometimes I think like a bleeped curse is so much funnier than a, than an actual curse word. Mm -hmm. If if someone's just like swearing because they think that's what's funny because they like misunderstood super bad back in the day or something. Like I, I don't think swearing is funny, but I think like a surprising bleeped swear word in, in the office, some of the funniest moments, in my opinion, are those rare moments where someone 
swears and it comes out of nowhere and it's bleeped. Mm -hmm. It's so funny when it catches you off guard. Um, and then like, sometimes I get emails from people that are like, Oh my God, my eight year old love your skits. And that ha that's happened often enough that I feel a slight sense of responsibility to not like ruin that family's day. It's a word <laughs> clean. Yeah. There's no reason if it's like, I, I rarely think it's necessary. So I just don't do it. Um, and then, you know, once in a while I dip my toes into politics, but the comment sections are just so toxic that I, I don't know, like I don't read comments a lot, but those comment sections get very toxic, very fast. And they devolve in, a, in an incredible way. Yeah. And it's just not fun for anyone. So I, tr I try to stay away from that kind of stuff. And, um, that's pretty much it. Like, I don't, I don't really talk about sex or drugs or anything, not because like, I don't know. I don't know. I just, I just by default, keep it PG because I don't think it's like necessary at this point for me to dive into those things. And, um, the young people watching me won't have any like, uh, super uncomfortable conversations because of me. <laughs> yeah. You, uh, uh and you're right. It's not just the bleep. Sometimes it's the hint of a cuss word is also funny. If you can put the cuss word in my head without even saying it. And a great one is, uh, when they were naming insects and you end with roach and you're like, I feel like, right. something, I feel like something's missing. What should, what else should we call it? And then it's the creepy pervert guy. That's like, I got something. Yeah. <laughs> so it's, uh, it, it's just as funny and, and it's funnier than actually just saying the word. Right. Yeah, I could have ended that sketch with a guy being like, cock. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I don't think that would. It, would, it wouldn't have landed. It wouldn't have landed. No, I think it's funnier for you to figure it out on your own. And then you don't have to have a, like a weird conversation about cocks with your child. So that's great. <laughs> Always, it's a good day if I don't make someone have an uncomfortable conversation with their child. Do you have uh, siblings, brothers, sisters, any of those? Uh, I have an older sister, uh, and I don't have kids. I have a little niece now. She's uh, a year and a half. Uh, so she has no idea what I'm talking about or even really who I am. <laughs> sure. But I'm like a familiar uh, human shape, I guess. I don't know how that works. When, when did your, uh, I mean, there had to have been a moment when your family were like, Ryan, like, like early on, like in, back when in 2010 or 11, mm -hmm. when you guys, before that video went viral. Yeah. Where your parents are like, all right, what are you going to do? Like, what's your plan in life? And then you've become a, a tremendously well-known individual. Um, are, are your, is your sister, does she ever give you a hard time about it? Is she, was there a moment where she called you and she was like, Ryan, holy shit. Like you, like, was it, did this happen? I mean, tell me about this moment, you know, when the family yeah. realized who you were. Um, it's funny. I mean, my, my family has always been, <laughs> incredibly supportive uh you know you hear a lot of like comedian origin stories that have like rough <laughs> childhoods and stuff i 100 percent don't have that my family always pushed me to pursue the things i wanted to do and um yeah it's just sometimes they'll sometimes they'll be like holy holy crap like did you see how many people saw your video in a day? I'm like, yeah, it's crazy. Like <laughs> there wasn't a particular moment, but it was a slow build where they kind of slowly realized or like, Oh, my friend, uh, like I was, someone added me on Facebook from work and they were like, Holy crap, you're Ryan George's brother. <laughs> kind of thing. Like just those little, those weird kind of moments, which, um, yeah, it's really nice. It's also like a little weird because it's my family, you know, I don't, I, I like to keep those things separate. So it's weird to me when someone uses a GIF of me on a Facebook thread and my family sees it or like, but my family's like super, they're so supportive that they'll like follow the Ryan George fan club, Instagram pages and stuff. And I'm like, don't do that. Don't do that. That's so weird. You can't have my mom in a fan club page. That's not like, <laughs> that's super weird. I actually, uh, I know, uh, a comedian uh, whose dad admins a Facebook fan group page. Oh, really? <laughs> yeah. And he didn't know about it for a while. And we were sometimes when comedians come through Houston, you know, we'll sit down for drinks or go have lunch. I try to show them that Houston is, is better in every way than say Dallas or Austin. 
And oh. um, <clears throat> we, uh, he found out that his dad's running a fan page group of his on Facebook and was so uh, repulsed, like angry about it. Like he was like, God damn it. Like your dad's overly supportive, you know, uh, yeah. which is great. Right. It's a great problem to have. It's just, it's kind of, it's kind of, well, please don't do that. <laughs> <laughs> I appreciate the support, but it's so weird. If, if I don't know, people are like, Oh, I love that last sketch. And she's like, I made him. And she doesn't comment that, but that's the vibe. You know, my, my mom is in a, a local bourbon group that I run. And oh, uh, cool. yeah, if anyone makes fun of me or roasts me or, you know, friends giving me a hard time, my mom chimes in and I'm like, don't say anything, please. Don't yeah. comment. Don't defend me. Just please, mom, please. <laughs> it's so much better if you just stay out of it. That's partially why I feel less comfortable posting my stuff on Facebook or Instagram because my family and my girlfriend's family are much more active on those platforms. And so you'll have these comments of uh, just random viewers that I don't know. And then like my girlfriend's uncle, who's like, ha ha. I'm like, ah, oh, no, like you weren't supposed to see this. <laughs> this is, I'm, I look like an idiot in my videos. Like I, I'm extremely weird and that's not how I am in real life at all. And so it was weird to go to family dinners and be me but then i know that they've seen me be like yeah you know <laughs> oh sure or, or throw quotes back at you all of your catchphrases yeah and they're also like they're mostly french so they don't really get it <laughs> so they're kind of like oh i saw your video and uh, a lot of people saw it and i'm like i know you have no idea what it was about but um in your personal <laughs> families and friends are, are they all french like that you guys speak in french instead of english like your mom? Uh, in my family, my immediate family, we speak English. We've always spoke English at home, but they sent me to French school growing up. And my girlfriend is French, but perfectly bilingual with a slight tilt to the French. And similar with me, completely bilingual with a, like better off in English. English is my native language. Um, so when my girlfriend and I speak, it's this weird hybrid of French and English. We're halfway through a sentence on change, but on parle en français, and then we switch back to English. Especially and when you're fighting or passionate. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Just whatever the first, sometimes words come faster in a different language and that's what comes up first. I'm sure it's the same with uh, every bilingual person on the planet. Uh, but yeah, that's the weird thing of living in Montreal is that that weird linguistic hybrid for sure. Uh, pivoting back to your, um, uh, your, your episodes, there has to be some, like you said, you're coming down to the wire. You've got to send it. You've got to upload it. And it's about to go live in within an hour. Are there some that you're just not, it, it doesn't feel right. It doesn't feel perfect and it eats away at you a little bit. And so you delay it or you upload it anyways. And then it maybe it doesn't see the numbers. Do you, do you pay attention to the numbers with each episode? Um, with, with pitch meetings, I don't really pay attention to the numbers. Um, and the only ones I kind of cringe at are the older ones where you can really tell that I haven't developed the style yet, you know, and they're like four minutes long and I'm talking real slow and not smiling. And yeah, I'm like, I'm even considering redoing some of those early ones where, where it's just. I think if you're watching a randomized playlist of pitch meetings, those must feel really weird to stumble upon because Definitely it's just foreign. It's a different show completely. So those ones make me cringe a little bit. Otherwise, I don't know if I'm not sure about a pitch meeting, what I tend to do is just like add other bits in there that I think are funny that sometimes aren't even related to the movie, but I think we'll still get a laugh. So yeah, I think maybe if, if a video is a little longer, it's because I wasn't really sure what to say. So I said not only everything, but also just a couple of random bits, you know, like some of the eight minute ones are probably because I was like, eh, or I didn't have time to do the necessary editing to find the best jokes and just to trim it down. Yeah. yeah. What, uh, how far back have you gone? Meaning I, I know you've done the Sam Raimi Spider-Man. So have you gone back further? 
I haven't done like the that weird old Italian Spider Man or anything. Um, <laughs> <laughs> no, but no, but I mean, yeah, I mean, just any movie really. I mean, I, 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 did you? Uh, I know you've done. I, I think you've done all three Matrix Matrixes, which is twenty yeah. twenty three years ago now. Um, yeah. What, how far back have you gone? Some of the classics. I've. I mean, I've I've done pretty much every superhero movie except like I haven't I don't think I've done the original Superman movies. I'm still working my way through the original Batman movies. Um, and then like just in terms of time, I've gone as far back as Dumbo. Like I did, I think that was like the 1940s, and it was like a black and white pitch meeting. The tricky thing with going back too far is that the way that pitch meetings end is with a screen rant article and there aren't a ton of them written about Dumbo from 19 from the 1940s. That's often yeah. a tricky thing. Like right now I'm going through the Harry Potter movies one by one and I'm working on prisoner of Azkaban right now. And I'm kind of like, that's always a tricky part with older movies is how do you end it with that sting of a screen rant article when the movie came out before screen rant even existed. Uh, I, that's always a little tricky. So I can't go too far back or the end thing will be about, you know, the fact that they rebooted this movie. If, if you know, whatever, whatever they did with that often happens, they often reboot movies. So I can, I can fall back on that. But like right now, prisoner of Azkaban, I'm, I'm working on the script. Like that's what I'm working on today. And I'm kind of like, dang, I don't know how to end this one. Like I, there hasn't been like new stories about the prisoner of Azkaban in a while. <laughs> Could you oh. not uh, run uh, a different uh, headline, like a, a, just any a headline article, you know, meaning only for ones that came out before Screen Rant existed, obviously? Or does yeah, it have to be? A I guess potentially I could just, yeah, make up an article, but um, just since I haven't done that, it feels wrong. But sometimes I've slightly modified the headline to, to make it fit the joke. But if you if you could somehow <laughs> if you could somehow tie the prisoner of Azkaban Gary Oldman uh, to the Tiptoes Gary Oldman movie where he played uh, a, a little person uh, and that movie oh, was a, that movie was a complete have you seen Tiptoes have you seen I that? haven't seen Tiptoes but I know I know about it yeah yeah it, it's Matthew McConaughey Gary I mean it's one of the greatest films no one's ever watched it's almost impossible <laughs> to even buy it online to find it to watch because I think it was pretty much scrubbed from the internet I think Matthew McConaughey bought up the rights to you know it was just a complete uh a r ridiculous film but um what what other ones do you have coming up that you're that you're wanting to hit over the next month or so? Well, I'm slowly w working my way through the Harry Potter movies. Um, a big part of your childhood, right? We've talked about that, or I've heard you talk about it. Yeah, I mean, I love Harry Potter. When I was uh, when I was ten or eleven, and there was like a big news story that they were looking for Harry Potter, like who was going to play Harry Potter. I was like ten years old, and I was like. I legitimately had Harry Potter glasses, not because of Harry Potter. Those were just the glasses that I had. And so in my head, I was like, well, I am Harry Potter, obviously. So I like wrote a letter to, I don't know who I intended to send it to, but I was kind of like, I would please consider me to play Harry Potter. Uh, I'm not British, but I trust that won't be a problem. Um, <laughs> and then I kind of like wrote that on my dad's old Mac and had him print it out. And then it was just like, I don't know where to send this. And that's kind of where the project ended. But yeah, yeah. I, like I grew up reading Harry Potter, like everyone from my generation, pretty much. Um, did you grow up reading Harry Potter? Because we're yeah. same generation. Yeah, same generation. Yeah. So so uh, sixth grade or fifth grade is when uh, the Sorcerer's Stone came out. I read all the way up to, um, I didn't read the Deathly Hallows in, in school. It wasn't until I met my wife and we started dating and her family was obsessed with Harry Potter. And the movies were coming out that we, I went back and read the Deathly Hallows and, and finished the series. But um, we, we would take our daughters, our older, you know, their, their teenage daughters are now 16 and 17. Wow. Yeah. <clears throat> we would take them uh, to see the films. It was like a Christmas thing. And they always came out in the fall, like in December, mm -hmm. they always felt like Christmas and it became this ceremonial uh, family outing that was just really important to us. Um, so same thing with uh, Matt Smith's Doctor Who, like, 
we were, that was like our family's doctor. Like we would watch it together. Uh, okay. so yeah, it, that's exciting. I mean, the, the Harry Potter, uh, series on screen rant would be, uh, pretty great, uh, pitch meeting ideas. Um, what's besides the Harry Potter thing, what's like something you've wanted to do, but just haven't found the right time to slot it. Or is it super downline? Like you just want to do it one day. It's super funny. We've been having this conversation between myself and the, and yourself. <laughs> That's not what I meant, but I could see how that was um, between myself and the uh, the Screen Rant channel manager, who I run the calendars by. About like I, I've never seen the movie Triple X with Vin Diesel, mm -hmm. but I've heard it's ridiculous, mm -hmm. and I think I should do it. But then she has this really good point where like videos online on youtube about the movie triple x do very well but it's because they have xxx in the title and like little youtube perverts click on that so i feel like the i feel like it would get a lot of views but a lot of confusing comments wrong views. like a lot of <laughs> a lot of misguided clicks for that one well i think <laughs> the the it's usually pitch meeting for and then the name of the film. I think I think enough people would at least well, it, it, it might it might draw people to your channel more, right? People, the little perverts don't have never heard of Screen Rant before. They find one and then they binge watch fifty of them. That's true. I mean, it would be called the title would be triple like triple X pitch meeting, which which sounds <laughs> it's misleading for you're like, just naked the whole time. <laughs> yeah, like people think that I started an OnlyFans or something. <laughs> yeah. They, <laughs> Uh, that'd be great. Uh, have you, well, you're, you've never done anything shirtless on, uh, I've never, I don't think so. I don't think I, I was, I was shirtless in, um, the, the Kevin Hart show that I did with my you friends. Have a, I could just hear it now. You have a triple X movie idea for me. And then it's just it, naked. <laughs> uh, yeah, that'd be great. I think you should definitely do that. I would, I would, uh, enjoy it greatly. It's, um, it's more of a curiosity thing. Yeah. Uh, listen, thank you so much for doing this. Um, where, I mean, I, I, I know we've been talking about where people can find you, but I like to officially ask where can people find you? Uh, where should we drive people to your, I know you're on Instagram. I know you're on Twitter. Uh, where, where can the folks find you? Um, well, if not, if you're on YouTube, you could just, uh, either write Ryan George or pitch meeting and that'll lead you to me. Otherwise I'm, uh, the Ryan George on Twitter and Instagram. Um, and on Facebook, I'm it's Ryan George because someone else took my name. So that's just <laughs> an unfortunate kind of situation I have to deal with. Yeah. Well, so and your website? Uh, it's ryangeorge.com also. Yeah. Sweet. Thanks yeah. so much, Ryan. I appreciate it. Uh, I really enjoyed it. And uh, yeah, if there's uh, any chance to catch up with you again one day and let me know when that uh, uh, package gets to you. I'd love to, to see you again. Yeah, will do. Thanks for sending that. I'm excited to get it. Cheers, buddy. Cheers. Cheers.